Welcome to Daily Quiz. This is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and today we're going to find out how high their PDIQ is. Parents' dental IQ, that is. Are you ready? A baby tooth isn't too important since it eventually falls out. Right or wrong? You're right. Those baby teeth save space for permanent teeth. Here's the next question. Fluoridation helps prevent tooth decay. Right or wrong? Right again. Fluoridation reduces tooth decay by 60%. Ready for the last question? A six-year molar is a baby tooth. Right or wrong? Right again. That permanent six-year molar should last a lifetime. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you certainly have a high PDIQ. Why? I see five good reasons, all with perfect smiles. And your prize is a lifetime of dental health for you and your children. By the way, how's your PDIQ? A public service announcement of the American Dental Association and this television station. Dick, you're described as one of the foremost Negro comedians. Is that description fairly accurate, or would you rather drop one or other of those two phrases, those two words? You know, I think that at one time it had to be one of the foremost Negro comedians. Uh, but I think now I, I rank among the top comedians anywhere in the world mm -hmm. because of the, the demand that have been for me and because of the uniqueness in social satire. It's not too many comics that would uh, mm -hmm. trail out into certain fields. But I think uh, the description, like it is now, could stay, but it just hasn't been updated, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Well, um, today, for example, uh, in your appearance, uh, say, here at the cave, um, are you out to give people a good laugh? Are you out to make a very definite and very uh, pungent point? Or is it a combination of the two? No, it's... Uh, it's a combination of one wrestling with myself, to be honest, with me. If I'm honest with me, I've got to be honest with the audience. Uh, two, I come in here only as an entertainer, and only to entertain the audience. Uh, when I go out and demonstrate for social changes, I don't go out to tell jokes. I happen to be a firm believer to believe that you can't laugh social problems out of existence. People like to say this, but we didn't laugh Hitler out of existence. And the day we find a cure for cancer, it won't be through jokes, it be through hard, sincere work. Laughing helps the people create an atmosphere uh, to amuse themselves, to take a five-minute break. But uh, the soldiers on the front line in Vietnam today, uh, you probably find your most rich humor pertaining to that war over there, which is for them. Uh, to stand up on the stage and use the same jokes back here that they use over there would be insulting and, and derogatory. But this is the, the, the thin line that humor carries. And if I work to a room of 10,000 of the world's biggest bigots and want them all over, if I didn't uh, get a laugh, I'd be a defeated man. Mm -hmm. Same thing if a minister worked to a room full of sinners and want them all over. If they laughed at everything he said, he would be a defeated man. Mm -hmm. Well, when I first saw you, which was, I think, either two or three years ago at the Hungry Eye in San Francisco, this was the time of, of Birmingham and Bull Connor. Uh, your humor then, uh, the monologue which you delivered then, was quite different from the one that you deliver now, uh, both in terms of racial texture as well as uh, your kidding the establishment. It's a little different. Have you, uh, is this a deliberate well, change? Is it a case of just evolving because of current events? No, there one. I'm a better comic today <laughs> than I am <laughs> then. I've gone through more. I've paid more dues. I've spent more money for research. I've been around the world uh, to various key spots, and I understand certain issues today. And, of course, my act in Canada uh, is not watered down, but there's certain little inside things that I don't want to take the chance Mm -hmm. of, uh, that have not made the papers. See, for instance, if I was in America tonight, I would be doing like, oh, ten minutes on the recent transit strike in New York City. Now, being this far west, I don't know how, and plus out of the country, I don't know just how mm -hmm. that affected the general public. If I was in California, I would do less material on the transit strike. Uh, you know, uh, what could go worldwide was the, the blackout in New York City. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt this was worldwide because uh, it caused a, a security problem and it's a potential threat to everybody on the face of the earth. 
of a potential, you know, inconvenience. Whereas a transit strike, uh, half the people in the world don't have transit. So this wouldn't affect them anyway, you know. So it's, it, it, it varies. Plus, I am a better comic today than I, am, than I was then. You were uh, uh, in the Watts area in Los Angeles during the riots there. It seems to me you were injured, were you? Yes, I was shot in the leg. Shot in the leg. What do you think uh, can come out of that? Anything? Did it make any point anywhere? I don't think it did. I, I think the point that it did made the politicians covered it up. And I, I don't think uh, anyone uh, could have actually slept Watts and realized the explosive situation, realized that this was a normal reaction to people who's been oppressed over a long period of time, that what happened in Watts didn't make the people criminal, the conditions that produced a Watts is criminal. I think uh, it's no big secret that if this social problem existed any place on the face of the earth today, we Americans could solve it. We have the know-how, we have the honesty when we want it, and we have the power, we have the finance. Uh, the fact that we played around with it, to me, uh, reminds me of the same path the Romans took before she fell. She was too strong to be destroyed from without and crumbled from within with little social problems at a time when the statesmen had been com completely pushed to one side in Rome and the master politicians had come to the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, politicians cannot solve this social problem. Politicians do more to create a social problem than solve one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same way that we can solve the Watts situation and the social problem is the same way we decided when we found out America was running behind the Russians in the missile race. We closed the gap not through emotions, not through lying to the public, but by sincere effort, by going out buying the best minds money could buy. And that way we closed the missile gap. The only way we're going to solve this social problem now, because it's so far out of proportion, is by bringing in top minds from all over the world and say, okay, baby, there's no disgrace to have a problem, but disgrace is having a problem that can be solved and you refuse to solve it and you have the facilities and the know-how. And so I said, I don't think we woke up from Watts. I think uh, everybody looked at Watts as a negative blur on the Negroes instead of looking at Watts as an American situation. I think the British took the same outlook on George Washington and that band that cats he had as America's looking at Watts today and had the British realize that this was not mob action. You see, five disciplined cops can stop a riot and a mob, but Hitler's army couldn't stop a protest. This is a legitimate protest that's going on. And uh, if we're going to put Watts down, then we got to crucify the American history book. Because the American history book when George Washington told the mother country we weren't going to pay the tax and dump our tea in the water. That was Watts, man. Uh, what happened in Watts was justified under the Declaration of Independence. We say we hold these truths to be self-evidence that all men are created equal and endowed by certain inalienable rights by the clear that when these rights are destroyed, it is your duty to destroy and abolish that government. The Declaration of Independence give people this right that's been oppressed over a long period of time. So I think had the British uh, went in and understood early Americans, George Washington and them, and realized they were dealing with a protest and not a riot, we might all today in America have a British accent. And it frightens me to think that we might make the same mistake that all of the world powers have made down to the years. Well, when you went into Watts, you went in in an attempt to help, and yet you weren't very successful. This brings up the point, who speaks for the Negro today? Oh, it's not a matter of who speaks uh, for the Negro. Uh, it's not a matter of going in to stop anything. I would be out of my mind to go in. If you want to stop something, go to Washington, D.C. and talk to white folks. That's the way you stop it. See, I have five kids. When my baby starts crying, if anybody had me kids, when the baby starts crying, if you run to the crib and yell, or shut up, the baby's going to cry louder. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got enough sense just in my own house to know you don't run into something after it starts to say shut up. I went in mainly and uh, to review the situation, to, uh, to study the pattern of it, and to ask the Negro, uh, what do you want? Um, and uh, not to tell him that this is not the way to get it. I couldn't tell a man. I am non-violent myself. I don't believe in killing nothing, either a fish or an animal. But it's very difficult to go in and scream to a man that he can't kill when he's subject to be drafted and sent to a foreign country and laying on some cold dirt shooting at some foreigner that he never met before to guarantee 
Vietnam instant freedom while his black loved ones have to get theirs on the installment plan. So I say again, you go to Washington, D.C. and to the white folks in the power structure and tell them to shut up. Uh, Any time uh, Negroes break through in anything, Negro leaders is not given credit for it. America's given credit for it. When uh, we had the march on Washington and it was everything white folks expected out of a good march, America was the one that got credit for this. If you could have heard the American Information Department's tapes that they released on this, uh, it was just unbelievable. And the day is over when something happened, Negro leaders going to get the blame. And when it happens good, America gets the blame. You know, the problem that exists over there is the American problem. And if you stop for one minute and ask yourself, who is the white leader in America? They have not. Who's the Jewish leader? Who's the Irish leader? Who's the Italian leader? Then why in the world are we the only group in a big country, the strongest country in the world, that got leaders? And the leaders were any good for you, we wouldn't have none either. And who gave them to us? The white press. So the true Negro leaders in America are, are unheard of by the masses, which is people like Lawrence Landers, uh, Jesse Gray, uh, Stanley Branch. These are the people on the local level that all of the national figures have to go in and deal with to have effective demonstrations. You know. uh, the Negroes uh, love Roy Wilkins, and Martin Luther King, Jim Foreman, Jim Foreman, uh, because they have always had the eloquence to go downtown and ask the white folks for our demands. But they kept coming back empty-handed. Oh, I love my mama, and if my mama didn't bring me nothing on Christmas, she could justify the first one. But don't let me sit through every Christmas and you not bringing me nothing, and when you do bring me something that's short of what everybody else is getting, I turn against my own mama. What's wrong, a Negro who's not close to me, but from a national level, and this is what happened. And, 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 and this is where the white policy have made a tremendous mistake, is by putting the Negro leaders out on limb, where... Uh, the, the things that they bring back to the community is far short of what the community wants. After the community had listened to them for a long period of time, uh, and, and, and it's going to be more problems of this. Uh, you see, <coughs> we have Negroes now flying jets for United Airlines, Negro stewardess, Hertz and Avis rental cars, you see Negroes in the ticket counter, in the airlines. Uh, Thurgood Marshall is Solicitor General, Ralph Bunch is in the U.N. But the type of Negroes that this impressed wouldn't throw a brick anyway. If they didn't have them, they would throw no brick. The brick-throwing ghetto brother, man, he ain't never heard of Thurgood Marshall. Don't know United Airlines exists till they have a wreck. And Hertz and Avis don't mean nothing to him. He never wanted a white woman. He don't want no tremendous education. He's been without it for so long, he's learned how to survive. All he's trying to do is outlive that rat in the bedroom, and there's no poverty program to teach him how to do that. That's what's going to bring America down to her knees. That's the guy we got to go in. We can't trick him. When you go into Watts and you ask him, say, what do y'all want? And he say, nothing. Uh, nothing, not in the dictionary, but nothing in a revolution means everything. You go to the Negro leaders, they give you a list of stuff. We want equal jobs, equal housing, equal schools. And a lot of things we forgot to mention. That little guy in the ghetto, when he say nothing, he mean everything. He ain't bring you no list. You know what he wants, give it to him. Only way we're going to solve the problem. And by blaming these things on Negro leaders, which America did, he's not going to solve the problem. Uh, if it weren't for demonstrations, the country would have gone up and smoked a long time ago. It's a simple pattern that the cities where we've had mass demonstrations in have been the cities that haven't blew up. And I don't know why, you know. White folks all over the world can do research, but for some reason they haven't done the research to really find out the, the angles to solve many of the problems. And if they knew this, they'd pay. They'd finance demonstrations. They'd get some of their Uncle Tom Negroes and, and get them a line going and get out. There's something about demonstration that gives the brick thrower a ray of hope. He feels that, well, somebody's really looking after him and going to solve this problem. Uh, another pattern that, 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 that seems to, to, to not only America, but the whole world seems to be ignorant of, is that we never have race rides in the South. You know, we blame all the racial everything on Mississippi. They never have race rides. This is northern products. And uh, Watts have never occurred in the South. So somebody better go and do the research and find out with all 
all the publicity the South have been getting, how come they never had a race ride? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because they're honest. Well, they don't hide it. And they air it out. And it's not hard to see. But in the North, they lie about it and create a tremendous bitterness. What, um, <clears throat> what do you think of the legislation which has been passed recently, uh, the Civil Rights Act and so forth? Is this helping any? Is this, uh, is this providing any kind of ray of hope to the guy in the ghetto? It's not providing too much ray of hope because he wants his now. You know, if you put a tourniquet around a man's leg, it stops the bleeding. But if you don't get into the hospital real soon and get the tourniquet off, gangrene's going to sit and he's going to die anyway. Well, what else along the legislative line do you feel will uh, come forth soon? Well, there'll be plenty of legislation that'll probably be coming forth. I think we'll start getting legislation for the North now. Uh, particularly, the civil rights legislation was aimed predominantly at the, the South. Uh, and uh, we need uh, legislation uh, that will make the United States Constitution work. And uh, this is a constitutional problem. We are not out demonstrating in Birmingham three years ago and all through the streets of America for something that didn't exist. We'd be very unfair if we were asking white folks to create something special for us. And I think they're very unfair when they create something special for us, like a civil rights bill. We didn't march for 64, 65 legislation. We marched for the United States Constitution. And if black America is going to be judged under 65 legislation, and white America is going to be judged under the United States Constitution, that's racial segregation. Uh, what is America telling us? They're going to give us a, a new version of racial segregation, or they're going to do away with it, period. And this is the problem that, that legislation creates. I mean, you see, if a man's been riding on your back for two weeks and uh, you never tell him to get off, he got a good ride. But at the point you turn around and tell him to get off your back, he might not get off, but he's going to have a bumpy ride from then on there. Mm -hmm. And for a hundred years, we've been had someone riding on our back and we never said anything. But now we've said, ask very gently to get off. And he's refused to. Uh, in a very insulting way, he's loosened his grip, and he says, Boy, let me tell you something. I know I'm wrong for riding your back, but I can't stop riding your back now. And you've got to be out of your mind to ask me to get off your back after me riding your back for a hundred years. But I won't ride your kids back. It's going to take a generation for me to get off your back. Well, I know he means that, so I'm going to head on down to the bridge and jump off. Because I'd just soon be in the river dead is have him riding on my back after I told him to get off. He, would, he didn't even have decent enough to sit right on my back for a while. Let's swap. Same, same thing. No different. And if white America had to wake up tomorrow morning, as black as I am, uh, they'd be fighting soon they open their eyes up. Because they would catch hell in the bedroom, man, before they even walked to the kitchen, before they even walked outside the house. And they wouldn't take it. And if they think we can put up with this, any longer than we have put up with it, then they're admitting that something's wrong with us some kind of way. Either we are inferior or superior, one of the two. How bumpy is this ride going to get? It's going to be very bumpy, very, very bumpy, because with the war going on in Vietnam now, and Negroes going over to Vietnam to fight, and when these Negroes come home, uh, they have a different attitude. You see, we don't have the type of Negroes we had during World War II, they could lay over in, in France and jump out the jeep and lay in the, the gutter when they heard the German planes coming by and didn't know at what, what time they were going to be killed and the war was over and the German come over here and we still got to jump out the jeep and get in the gutter to let him by to get the job and this and that, which is no malice to the government, to the Germans. The malice is shown to the government. They can let this, permit this to happen. Well, you got a different Negro we're dealing with now. Negro 20 and 30 years ago had an empty stomach. Today the Negro has a full stomach and a hungry mind, and a hungry mind do not tolerate the same thing as an empty stomach. A hungry mind, Einstein had a hungry mind. An uh, empty stomach deals by smell, and a hungry mind deals by sound. And all those things don't sound right to us anymore. This is what's affecting the ride. You see, we were... In World War II, when they was bringing German prisoners back to America to the southern POW camps, uh, the Negro guards, uh, 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 when they stopped to eat, uh, the German prisoners was permitted to go in the front door of the restaurant and eat. And the Negro American soldiers had to go to the back door 
That can never happen again. Uh, Charlie Drew, if you could imagine how many millions of people would be dead today if it weren't for blood plasma. Well, an American Negro by the name of Charlie Drew invented blood plasma, and he bled to death in a South Carolina hospital waiting room because they didn't accept Negroes after he was in an automobile accident. Now, these things are obsolete, and you've got a different Negro that America have to deal with today. And she might as well wake up and get aware of this, but she's going to have to deal honestly and fairly because all the tricks are up. And as far as us out here at the head of the civil rights movement, we don't know where it's going to happen next. We, we can guess. We probably figure Chicago will explode. Uh, probably Los Angeles again. Uh, uh, San Francisco area will probably explode. But you're just guessing at it because you know uh, what potential trouble spots look like, but you have no guarantee that uh, some little small area, and I think when California blew, everybody should have been aware that it can happen anywhere, because this was the last place that people that wasn't informed felt it was going to blow. The government knows about it. This was evidence when after they released after the riot that out of 21 cities that they knew were potential powder kegs, that the only two cities that didn't accept their summer help was Chicago and Los Angeles. So I think uh, it's very obvious that certain people in certain key positions knows what's going on mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. For political reasons, they refuse to really deal with it honestly. Like the McCorn report, uh, this is the, one of the biggest frauds going. Mm -hmm. He started out pretty good, uh, and then again, uh, you, you sometimes wonder about the even if they had been honest with it. You know, how are you going to say in 101 pages what the Bill of Rights said in one? You know. And so, uh, but to look at that McCorn report, it was, a, it was a complete, total disgrace. And it was a political stick. No more, no less. And to think that uh, Americans are supposed to be so intelligent will end up spending over $100,000 for a three-month fraud and paid to get it. And we paid for the aspirin to not cure the headache, but fix it so we can't feel it. This is all we did. You mentioned Chicago as a possible trouble spot. Is this the reason that, that you announced that you were interested in uh, running for mayor? No, the, the, this was the reason that we demonstrated to try to, to hold it back. Uh, we had a little problem in Chicago, but it was because we had so much trouble from the city. We had found it very difficult to muster Negroes to demonstrate because the city, Chicago, was so large that uh, in going out, with the city working against us as hard as they did, it was very difficult for us to get effective demonstrations in every area. So we concentrated on the powder keg, which was the south side of mm -hmm. Chicago, which we're still going to trials now. You know, like we mm -hmm. kneel down the street and pray, and you, you're arrested for inciting a riot. And cops jumped on me in Chicago, put me in the hospital for almost four days, and very conveniently the cop goes to the hospital, and they end up with assault and battery charges against me, and all this type of stuff that would never happen in the south, you know. The beauty of a Bull Connor was he came out and watched his cops, man. When he screamed police brutality, he didn't sit in the ivory tower like our police commissioner in Chicago and says, I don't believe it. It's not true, you know. Bull Connor was in the street, man, and he knew what happened. And he would tell you, yeah, I'm going to knock him down again tomorrow. And, uh, uh, you know, nobody likes pain, but physical pain is much different from mental pain. And what white America sends us through up north is mental pain. Uh, which is which, is, which runs you crazy eventually, which leads you into mass violence. What do you think about uh, Martin Luther King's movement to Chicago? How do you think that's going to end up? I think it's frightening that the uh, city-led conditions get to the point where uh, Dr. King had to come in. You know, I think uh, a city, the number, second largest city in America, should have been able to solve the problems without a Dr. King having to come in. And the fact that he's there creates very interesting analysis because the nonviolent movement have never been effective up north. Uh, matter of fact, it went the other way. Uh, it gave the Negro a cheap cop-out up north. The Negro said, I would have gone to Mississippi with you, but I'm too violent. Uh, he's never had no record for hitting white folks or lynching white folks, so he took a cheap cop-out. But he's been telling himself for five years that the only reason he didn't get involved was because he's too violent. He's told himself this, and now you have created a violent northern Negro that's waiting for a reason to hit. And you see, when in Selma, Alabama, when we demonstrate in Selma, we hold a mass rally. Well, you've got 12,000 Negroes at the most living in Selma. So uh, if 3,000 come out to the rally, you have a fourth of the Negro population that you've taught nonviolence to. And that fourth can go back and teach it to 
another fourth, and then you hold your next rally and you get some more. Well, in Chicago, uh, we held a rally tonight with a million and a half Negroes. We don't have the facilities to house a fourth. So in Chicago, if 5,000 people showed up, which is a good rally, but what is the percentage of 5,000 out of a million and a half? And that means your town is not nonviolent. And it would take you 20 years to reach a whole town without the white folks giving us their communication system. Will they give you that system? No, after we take it, they will. I think after Watts broke out, we could have went in and held a prayer meeting anywhere we wanted to hold in Los Angeles. But in Chicago, we got arrested for holding a prayer meeting. So if the riot break out, they give us the whole town to pray in. We haven't run short of clean water. Yet. Oh, some of our cities and towns dump their waste into our waters. Some of our factories do. But there's still time. Still enough clean water. And it's true that farm chemicals and mine wastes are polluting some rivers and streams, making some lakes unusable. But there's still time, still enough clean water. Anyway, we know how to clean up our water. And we must do it, so we will. Won't we? Why, there are people working on the problem right now. Waste treatment plants are being built today, or being planned, or being talked about. But there's still time. Still enough clean water? Would you help? Our supply of clean water is in danger. The facts are all in the new booklet. Get your copy. Write Clean Water, Washington, D.C. There's still time.